Hi, my name is Father Mike Schmitz, and I want to thank you for joining us this morning for this virtual Front Pew Mass. Um, little announcement. The Ascension Presents Mass will be moving from Ascension Presents YouTube channel to a whole new YouTube channel called Sundays with Ascension. Uh, there's a link in the description below. You can follow that. We'll have that Sunday Mass on that YouTube channel, Sundays with Ascension, as well as reflections and more. The idea behind that is we have so much content on Ascension Presents that the people at Ascension Press, they said, why not? create our own YouTube channel for the Sundays. So basically to make it easier for you and other people to find this mass when they're unable to get to mass and to engage with the reflections that help them hopefully get more deeply into mass, click that link in the description below, hit subscribe and ring that bell so you get notifications and don't miss a thing that Sundays with Ascension puts out. God bless. I invite you to stand. Turn your ear, O Lord, and answer me. Save the servant who trusts in you, my God. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I cried to you all the day long. Psalm 86, verses 1 through 3. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. As we uh, begin to celebrate these sacred mysteries on this Sunday morning, we uh, first, one of the things that always happens is the antiphon, right? So always, as we're coming to Mass, as we're leaving Mass, there is this, uh, this antiphon that we pray, and it typically comes from Scripture. And this one from Psalm 86 just reminds us of um, the fact that whenever we approach the Lord, <laughs> sometimes we don't know what to say. One of the things we could always say is, have mercy on me, Lord. In fact, that's how we begin Mass, right? The way, one of the ways we begin Mass is by recognizing, Lord, these last, this last day, this last weekend, this last week, maybe this last large season of my life, I have not lived how you've called me to live. I've not, I've not loved the way that you have instructed me to love. I haven't even let myself be loved in the way that you love me. And so we just come before the Lord and ask for mercy. And what is mercy? We know this. Mercy is the love that we don't deserve, but we need. It's the love we deserve the least, but need the most. And so every time we come before the Lord, we acknowledge that recognition that I'm not the person I should be. I have not loved the way I should love. I haven't let myself be loved the way I should let myself be loved. But God, you want to help me. You want to give me the love I deserve least but need the most. So we ask the Lord right now at the beginning of this Mass, Lord Jesus, you came to call sinners. Lord, have mercy. Lord, Lord have, mercy. have mercy. You came to seek and to save the lost. Christ, have mercy. Christ, Christ have mercy. You live to intercede for us at the right hand of the Father. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Glory to God in the highest. Amen. And on Amen. earth, peace to people of goodwill. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we give you thanks for your great glory. Lord God, heavenly King, O God, Almighty Father, Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, have mercy on us, for you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. O God, who caused the minds of the faithful to unite in a single purpose, 
Grant your people to love what you command and to desire what you promise. Then amid the uncertainties of this world, our hearts may be fixed on that place where true gladness is found through our Lord, Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to be seated as we hear from God's word. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, I know their works and their thoughts, and I come to gather nations of every language. They shall come and see my glory. I will set a sign among them. From them I will send fugitives to the nations, to Tarshish, to Put and Lud, Mosak, Tubal, and Javan, to the distant coastlands that have never heard of my fame or seen my glory. And they shall proclaim my glory among the nations. They shall bring all their brothers and sisters from all the nations as an offering to the Lord on horses and in chariots, in carts, upon mules and dromedaries, to Jerusalem, my holy mountain, says the Lord, just as the Israelites bring their offering to the house of the Lord in clean vessels. Some of these I will take as priests and Levites, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The response is to go, go out to tell all the world the good news. Go out to tell all the world the good news. Praise the Lord, all you nations. <coughs> Glorify him, all you peoples. Go, Go out to tell all the world the good news. For steadfast is his kindness towards us, and the fidelity of the Lord endures forever. Go out to tell all the world the good news. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, you have forgotten the exhortation addressed to you as children. My son, do not disdain the discipline of the Lord or lose heart when reproved by him. For whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. He scourges every son he acknowledges. Endure your trials as discipline. God treats you as sons. For what son is there whom the father does not discipline? At the time, all discipline seems a cause not for joy, but for pain. Yet later, it brings the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who are trained by it. So strengthen your drooping hands and your weak knees. Make straight paths for your feet, that what is lame may not be disjoined, disjointed, but healed. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Chapter 13, verses 22 through 30. Jesus passed through towns and villages, teaching as he went and making his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, will only a few people be saved? He answered them, Strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I tell you, will attempt to enter, but will not be strong enough. After the master of the house has arisen and locked the door, then you will stand outside knocking and saying, Lord, open the door for us. He will say to you in reply, I do not know where you are from. And you will say, we ate and drank in your company and you taught in our streets. And he will say to you, I do not know where you are from. Depart from me, all you evildoers, and there will be wailing and grinding of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves cast out. And people will come from east and the west, and from the north and the south, and will recline at table in the kingdom of God. For behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. Wait, you have a seat. So one of the things I've, I've found, I've discovered this about myself, but I think it's kind of a common thing, is um, that my uh, circle of, of, my areas of, of interest, like vastly outstrip my areas of influence. It's one of those kind of situations where, like, I, I find myself so preoccupied. Like, my, maybe in this is going to be a situation where probably you experience the same thing, where um, the things you're interested in um, are so <laughs> much bigger than 
the areas of influence in your life. And so, I mean, which is not a bad thing. I mean, it's good to be interested in a lot of things. God made us curious. God made us inquisitive. God made us want to know stuff. And so to have a level of interest, good. Until, until it becomes not good, right? Until um, we become so distracted by our circle of interest that we don't pay attention to our circle of influence. It's one of those kind of situations where we can realize that um, here's a person who I'm, I'm so interested in the state of global politics that I don't participate in my local politics, right? Or that kind of, the person who is, is always complaining about like the state of the family in the modern world, but you neglect your own family in your world. Um, or even just that, those people, maybe some of us who would say, man, look around the world, it looks like the world's going to hell in a handbasket, that kind of a thing. But you don't stop to ask the question, what am I going to hell? We can be so concerned about the state of the world that I neglect the state of my soul. And I think that when we get to that place, um, when we get to that place, things become dangerous. For, for, so I think that's, you know, the, the guy, he doesn't even say who it is, but in the gospel today, said someone asks Jesus, Lord, will many or only a few be saved? And it's one of those questions that's like, that's a good question. But I think in some ways it can be an abstraction, right? Because I just want to know numbers. Like, tell me, like, what, what, what are the odds uh, when it comes to out there, how many people will be saved? It can be given an abstraction, but also can become a distraction. And the distraction is, if I'm more concerned with how others are living, will many or only a few be saved? I can make it about someone, someone else. Because if it's, if it's about others, again, it's, others are an abstraction. If it's about others, Others are a distraction. And I love this because Jesus, I mean, here's the Lord who knows us really, really well. And what does he do? He, he basically cuts through that area of interest and goes right to the area of influence. When there's this temptation to have an abstraction and have a distraction, Jesus makes it incredibly personal and makes it incredibly practical because his answer is not a number. His answer is, okay, here's what you need to do. The word he says is, okay, basically, strive. He doesn't tell us a number, but he tells us what to do. He says strive. In fact, that the Greek word for strive is, is imperative. So he basically, Jesus says, you want to have an abstract number because you're really interested in will many or only a few be saved? Jesus says, you strive. That's his answer. Will many or only a few be saved? You strive. Because you're going to have to fight for it. You know, I think that's really interesting. I think we're going to talk about this. What is it to, to actually strive after the, uh, the Lord? Because Jesus even says, for many will attempt to enter heaven, but won't be strong enough. And one of the things I want to highlight is, is we'll say this, uh, two truths and two lies. There are two truths about, about striving. There are two truths and two lies. And the first thing I think Jesus highlights is that um, no one, including me and including you, just automatically gets heaven. No one just automatically gets heaven, which is a big temptation. I mean, I know that um, doing funerals, the, the temptation is to canonize the person. I, I, don't know if, I don't know if you guys heard this. There, there's kind of this old joke that talks about how there's these two gangsters and they're brothers and really bad guys. And at one point, uh, one of them, Tommy, Tommy dies. And uh, his brother goes to the priest and says, Father, I, uh, I'm going to give you, I know you have a lot of bills in this church right now. I know you have a lot of debt in this church right now. I'm going to make a massive donation to your church as long as at my brother Tommy's funeral, you say the words, uh, Tommy was a saint. You need to say those words, Tommy was a saint at, at his funeral. Or, and I'll give you the money. If you don't, I'm not going to give you the money. So the priest is like, I don't know what to do. He gets up and during the, during the homily, he's like, okay. Um, he says, uh, Tommy was a crook. Uh, Tommy was a liar. He, he cheated people out of money. He hurt people. He destroyed people's lives. He was an awful human being. But compared to his brother, Tommy was a saint. <laughs> that is okay. Hey, whenever you tell a joke, it's bad. But, but, that, but the idea, the temptation, you guys, thank you for humoring me. But the temptation, of course, in this whole situation is in a funeral is just to say, you know, they're in heaven right now without any evidence. Again, I'm not making any judgments about, you know, but just to, to, to declare that someone is in heaven without any evidence that they ever strived after heaven is kind of premature because you remember it, we don't, the first truth, we don't automatically get heaven. Just like we don't, I mean, to think that we automatically get to heaven is, is, is pretty remarkable. I, I've mentioned this before, but I'll, I'll say it again. Um, 
I think about the Olympics and a couple different Olympic sports, Olympic events. They have like the luge. Uh, for the luge, you just, what do you do? You lie down and go down this ice chute. Um, for uh, curling, you simply sweep the ice. And I think about the, both those, both those, uh, those events, both those sports at the Olympics. And I think, man, I can't even lie down at the Olympic level. Like much, I can't even sweep at the Olympic level. And what gives me the idea or the impression that if I can't even just automatically go to the Olympics for lying down or the Olympics for sweeping, what makes me think I would just automatically get heaven without striving after heaven? Even those people, they say, but Lord, we ate and drank with you. Okay, but you didn't strive. You didn't strive after heaven. You know, at the same time, um, so we know the number one, first truth, I don't automatically get heaven. The second truth is even though we don't automatically get heaven, we have to strive after heaven, we can't earn heaven. This is the second truth. We, no one can earn heaven. That, that, that we do not work our way to heaven. That is something that is impossible to do because salvation is a gift. Like the grace of God, it, salvation is a gift. It's unearned, it's completely undeserved that we only have access to the Father because of what Jesus has done for us and the, his outpouring of his Holy Spirit. So these two truths are very, very important. One, we do not automatically get heaven. And secondly, you can't work for heaven. You can't earn heaven. At the same time, as a gift, it's a gift we have to use. I think about this a lot because um, imagine you had parents who you wanted to play the guitar. And so at some point, they say, okay, here's the gift of a guitar. And not only here's the gift of a, gu of a guitar, we're also gonna pay for whatever lessons you, you need. We're also going to pay for any repairs you will ever need in the life of this guitar in the life of you. And say, great, you have this gift, but there is a massive difference between having a guitar and being able to play the guitar, being ha having access to lessons and actually going to the lessons. There's a difference between having access to a repair shop and going to the repair shop when things are broken. I mean, think about this. You have the guitar. Here's the gift. I just don't show up for lessons. Or I do show up for lessons and do what I did when I was a kid uh, for the piano and just not practice in between lessons. Like that's something that people could do. Or yeah, the, the guitar was doing fine and then like the neck broke or then you know, one of the strings broke and I just, I just don't bother to take it in. There's a massive difference between having this completely undeserved, unearned, free gift and actually using this completely unearned and undeserved and free gift. And that's how so many of us can live, right? Because we've been given the gift of salvation by Jesus Christ. At some point, most of us have been baptized. So here we are as God's sons and daughters. And yet we might not live like that. We have access to lessons, like we can come to mass, but we just absent ourselves from mass. Or maybe we go to mass, but we don't actually pray in between lessons. We don't, right? we don't pray between mass. Or when we fall down, when our hearts get broken, when the relationship with the Lord gets broken, and he just simply says, I, the, it, the price has been paid. Come back to me in confession. Like, okay, ah, maybe later. Salvation is a free gift that we can't earn. Heaven is a free gift that we can't earn. But we have to choose it. So we don't automatically go to heaven. You can't earn heaven. But we have to choose heaven. Or else we don't get heaven. We have to strive, as Jesus says. And that leads us to the two lies. And the first lie about needing to strive is, uh, it's kind of a common thing that we think these days, is discomfort is dangerous. That discomfort is dangerous. I, I, I'd gotten an email not too long ago from a, a young woman who was very concerned. She'd heard about this thing called Exodus 90. Exodus 90 was started a bunch of years ago by a guy, some guys who were in the seminary. And now some of them are priests, some discerned out, and they're uh, married men and some single men. Um, but they re recognized there was something in their lives. They, were, they said, our lives are so cluttered in this modern world. Our lives are so busy and full in this modern world that we don't really think that we're actually striving after the Lord. And so they decided, said, we're going to do this thing for 90 days. We're going to have some brotherhood, right? So we're going to meet at least once a week with the, you know, however many there were of them. And then they're going to have these certain disciplines. So this woman had emailed me and said, she has a friend who was thinking about Exodus 90. And she said, it seemed a little too rigorous. It seemed a little too extreme because there's actually a number of disciplines. Here's, here's the disciplines for Exodus 90. Um, they, you have to take short, cold showers. That's one. Um, you have to practice uh, regular, intense exercise at least three times a week. You have to get at least seven hours, recommended eight hours of sleep per night. But then here's some of the things you have to not do, right? You have to abstain from alcohol, 
for the 90 days. You have to abstain from uh, sweets or dessert, uh, from soda, uh, from um, eating between meals. On Mondays, on Wednesdays and Fridays, you would fast, so no meat, and then only one large meal with two smaller meals. Uh, they ask that you don't watch TV, movies, or uh, sports. They ask that you not play any video games, and that when you use your computer, you can only use your computer for work or for school or for like essential things like paying bills, that kind of th that kind of situation. And so this woman, who again, who was very genuine, just very, very inquisitive about this whole thing, she said that, again, that seems so extreme. And I thought about this, wait a second. Um, so for 90 days, just again, only three months, it's not like this is how you're gonna live the rest of your life, but for three months, you're not gonna snack between meals. That seems kind of smart, actually. Um, that. Uh, for 90 days, you're going to try to get a full night's sleep every night. It doesn't seem too extreme. That you're gonna to try to exercise at least three times a week. Again, doesn't seem very extreme. That you're not gonna drink alcohol for, for 90 days. That's not extreme. That you're not gonna eat sweets or soda for 90 days. That, that doesn't seem extreme or overly rigorous. And well, he's going through all the list of things. You're not gonna play video games for 90 days or have excessive use of uh, TV or movies or sports. That I was thinking about this and realized that uh, that's kind of how most of the world actually lives. That most of the world, they don't have access to constant snacks. Most of the world, I guess we do have access to the internet now, but you think about this, this is how almost all of humanity has lived for almost all of human history. But for us, that seems extreme. For us, that seems rigorous. You think about this, for tens of thousands of years, the default state for human beings was struggle. For tens of thousands of years, the default for human beings was discomfort. I, I would say that, I'd say as human beings, we're designed for struggle. As, as human beings, we're, we're created to strive. As human beings, we're often our best in battle, but for the last hundred years or so, what's happened is that we have, we have been so oriented towards comfort because of that discomfort Discomfort seems odd. Discomfort seems dangerous. To look different would seem dangerous. And yet, unless we're willing to strive, unless we're willing to engage in battle, unless we're willing to really actually struggle, we're going to be on that wide road that Jesus talks about that doesn't lead to heaven. In fact, um, we get so used to like how everyone lives. Most Americans live in debt. And there's this guy named Dave Ramsey, who I always invoke his name. Um, but, but Dave Ramsey talks about this. He says, yeah, if you live like everyone else, you're going to be just like everyone else. But if you want to get out of debt, what you're going to have to do is, he, he uses this phrase, he says, you're going to have to live with gazelle-like intensity. And the idea is, of the gazelle is, if a lion's chasing you down, you can't just meander your way through the savannah. Like, if it's a cheetah's running after you, you can't just kind of jog away. You have to have this gazelle-like intensity. If you're going you know, if to, the, if the debt is coming after you, it says, you run away from that debt, you attack that debt with gazelle-like intensity. And so he even says that that might mean what people call it on his show. He said that might mean that for the next two years, you live off of rice and beans, beans and rice, that, that you live differently. You're striving. Why? Because you're, because there's some battles that are worth fighting. There are some things that are worth fighting for. I mean, think about an Olympic athlete who have to get to bed on time and they don't snack and they, they get this amount of exercise and they do these amounts of things. They don't drink alcohol, all these things. Why? Because there's some things worth fighting for. So if paying off your debt is something worth fighting for, if going to the Olympics is something worth fighting for, question, is heaven worth fighting for? Jesus seems to think so. You know, when Jesus says that word, he says, you, you strive, the word Jesus uses for the word strive is a word that can be translated into English, agonize. It's actually the same root of what is described, what Jesus experienced in the garden, in his passion. When he's going through his agony, that's the same word that Jesus says when you're going for heaven, agonize for heaven, strive for heaven, just in the exact same way that he agonized during his passion. But for us, we have to ask the question, is heaven worth fighting for? And if it is, where am I fighting? If it is, how am I fighting? At the same time, that third, that first, first truth that we don't automatically get heaven, the second truth, we can't earn heaven, can't work our way to heaven, the first lie is that discomfort is dangerous, but the other lie is that harder is holier, or harder equals holier. Because just because something's difficult doesn't mean that it's good for us. 
the difficulty is not the point. In fact, we can say it like this, the narrow gate that Jesus talks about, the narrow gate is not the point. What's beyond the narrow gate, that's the point, right? The whole point is not how difficult the road is, the whole point is where that road leads to. I mean, think about this, what, is, what does Jesus say to those who are outside who are knocking on the door, saying, let us in? He says to them, I don't know where you're from. In another gospel, Jesus says, I don't know you. What does that mean? That means basically, I don't have a relationship with you. So all of the fighting, all of the struggling, all the striving, all the agonizing is oriented towards what? It's oriented towards knowing him. It's all oriented towards becoming like him. It's all oriented towards doing what he did, which is doing the Father's will, which is so key. We're going to strive, absolutely. We're going to agonize, yes. We're going to battle and fight for what? It's going to be hard. It's going to be uncomfortable. But it's supposed to, it's supposed to lead to a relationship. The difficulty isn't the point. The narrow road is not the point. What the narrow road leads to, that's the point. That's why in the second reading today, from the letter to the Hebrews, it's so good where he says at the time, because here's the author to the Hebrews, he's writing to a group of people who would know what it's like to live in, in pain. They know what it's like. He, they all know what it's like to struggle. They know what it's like to suffer. They've been persecuted. And they know that it stinks. And so the author says, at the time, all discipline seems a cause not for joy, but for pain. Definitely true. Yet, yet later, it brings the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who are trained by it. Now that word righteousness, the fruit of the difficulty, right? The fruit of the training is righteousness. That word righteousness simply literally means right relationship. That the fruit of the discipline is now I have a right relationship with my God himself. And that's one of the things is, is we realize that all of the disciplines, all the asceticisms of Exodus 90 or any striving after the Lord should be leading and should be training in trust. I mean, think about this. Anytime you and I take time aside and say, I'm going to pray now instead of doing anything else, we're being trained in trust. That, okay, I'm not doing anything but talking to the Lord and I trust that he hears me and I trust that he wants me here and I trust that, that, um, He's present as I am present. That, that every time we, we experience failure, it, that's being trained in humility. Every time we experience even our brokenness and our weakness, and we bring that brokenness, bring that weakness to the Lord, we're growing in friendship. I mean, when we let the Lord love us as we are right now, we're actually growing in friendship with God himself. See, all of this, the taking time to pray, uh, even in the midst of our failure, in the midst of our weakness, all that striving is meant to bring us back again and again and again into contact with God. And that contact with him brings about the fruit of the training, which is the right relationship. So here's the last thing. The last thing is, um, what is one way this week you're going to strive for heaven? Like what is one way this week that you're going to battle for heaven? What's one way? Not, not all the things you're going to do. Here's a big checklist of things. But just what's one way that you're going to struggle for heaven? Because we know, we know we can't earn heaven, but we must choose heaven. Especially in our world, um, we will never, living in this world, living like everyone else, we will not drift to heaven. Therefore, we have to fight for heaven. So, this week, where will you fight for heaven? This week, in what way will you struggle for heaven? This week, how? How will you strive after heaven? I invite you to stand as we profess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit 
was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Confident in our Father's love for us in the midst of this world, we now approach him with all of our needs. That the church, through clear proclamation of the gospel and through works of mercy, may always comfort those who are enduring trials of every kind, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That government leaders around the world may make their decisions in light of the truth and justice that characterize God's kingdom, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That those who find their pregnancy a trial too difficult to bear may experience new strength from God and from the assistance of all of us. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That students returning to school in these days may draw wisdom and knowledge from the Holy Spirit and fulfill their duties diligently and safely. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That the sick may experience the peace and joy that comes from trusting God and his providence in their lives. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That all who have died may be received into the everlasting banquet of God. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. We continue off our prayer by praying our Diocese of Duluth prayer for vocations. Um, please pray for vocations in our diocese, but also uh, whatever diocese you're in, pray for those vocations to married life, to the consecrated single life, to uh, priesthood and religious life as we pray. Almighty Father, we beg you for an increase in religious vocations and holy marriages in our diocese. Help us to be generous in our response to your call. Choose from our homes those who are needed for your work and strengthen us with the courage to say yes and to follow you. Help us as a diocese, as a parish, as families, to encourage and foster vocations to the priesthood, permanent diaconate, and consecrated life. We commend our prayers to our patroness, Mary, Queen of the Rosary, and ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord. God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you, fruit of the earth and work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become our spiritual drink. Blessed be God forever. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and the glory of his name, for our good and the good of all of his holy church. O Lord, who gained for you a who gained for yourself a people by adoption through the once sacrifice, one sacrifice offered once for all. Bestow graciously on us, we pray, the gift of unity and peace in your church through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just. Our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, for you so loved the world that in your mercy you sent to us the Redeemer to live like us in all things but sin so that you might love in us what you loved in your Son, by whose obedience we have been restored to those gifts of yours that by sinning we had lost in disobedience. And so, Lord, with all the angels and saints, we too give you thanks as in exaltation we acclaim. Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of hosts, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy, and you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you willed to reconcile us to yourself, grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, the mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, and with all your saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant Francis, our Pope, Daniel, our Bishop, the Order of Bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, our merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who were pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory through Christ our Lord, through whom we bestow on the world all that is good. Through him, and with him, and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. Lord with your spirit. Let us offer one another a sign of Christ's peace. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, 
and you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, Lord I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. An act of spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there, and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. The earth is replete with the fruits of your work, O Lord. You bring forth bread from the earth and wine to cheer the heart. Psalm 104, verses 13 through 15. Let us pray. Complete within us, O Lord, we pray, the healing work of your mercy and graciously perfect and sustain us so that in all things we may please you. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. A couple quick announcements. One is, I mentioned this last week, but um, Thank you for praying for us. This Mass is always for those who are joining us from the virtual front pew. Um, so we're always offering for you whenever you join us, as I said, join us. Um, secondly, the thing was the first thing, which is next week, this week, upcoming, oh my gosh, upcoming week is when students arrive back on campus. Uh, in fact, uh, our freshmen will arrive on campus Wednesday and Thursday of this week. So please pray for them. Pray for uh, that we meet them. Pray that they encounter the Lord in, in a unique way. Unique way. Pray, pray that they encounter this community in a way that changes um, uh, not only the next four years of their lives, but their eternity. Please pray for that. Um, also, we got to have Emmeline back for, we had a hiatus over the course of the summer. She's back and with our new female missionary, Katie. So you got to meet or re-meet Emmeline and meet Katie this morning. So they're part of the missionary focus team we have on campus. So there's two guys, two girls. These are the two girls. Um, super grateful for them because, uh, yeah, just they're ready to go out on campus and bring the gospel to as many people as possible. Lastly, as, as part of the virtual front pew, I think we announced this last week, made a little extra video. Um, from now on, maybe starting next weekend, give or take, uh, there is another YouTube channel called Sundays with Ascension. And that's where these masses will be. That is where other like Sunday reflections will be and other kind of like homily type things. So Sundays with Ascension, uh, look for that. When you find it, if you can subscribe, that'd be wonderful. Click that little bell to receive notifications. That'd be great if you ever wanted to be continue to be part of the virtual front pew. That'll be on a new YouTube channel called Sundays with Ascension. That all being said, let's pray. Saint Michael, the archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the heavenly host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits 
who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Almighty God bless you all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Thanks be to God. Salve Regina, Mater Misericordiae, Vita Dulce Do, Et Spes Nostra Salve, Ha Te Clamamus, Exules Filiae, Ha Te Suspiramus, Gementes et Flentes, In Ac Lacrimarum Vale, Ea Ergo, Advocata nostra, e los tuos, misericordes oculos, ad nos converte. Et Jesum, benedictum fructum ventris tui, nobis, post hoc exilium, ostende. O oh, clemens, o oh,